Kim, what are these pictures? Okay, so the image on the left is a CT picture and it's starting at the top of the lungs and going up and covering the brain. So what we see there is the skull. It's kind of a low resolution picture, but we see the skull there and we see the brain inside and the brain is just um, nothing, no like real contrast there. It's just like soft tissue and it's all flat gray. Um, but the skull is bright, meaning that it's denser. That's what you see on CT. On the right is a pet picture, and there, the darker it is, the more metabolism there is. So this is a, a probably most likely an FDG pet, and FDG is fluorodeoxyglucose, and so wherever glucose goes, the FDG goes, and there the FDG um, uh, decays, has radioactive decay, and it's and uh, and uh, the radioactivity is picked up and traced back, and you get an image of where that radioactivity came from. In other words, you're seeing where the glucose is or the metabolism. And the point of this picture, we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, what Can we're you see... measure any of these things with ultrasound? Um, well, that's what I wanted to, to start out. <laughs> like... <At the> bottom. <laughs> Kim's about to tell you that you can use proxies for this glucose uptake. Okay. And that's so... called functional ultrasound. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What we want to do today is just briefly talk about a little bit of brain physiology, and then we're going to get into functional ultrasound imaging. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this, because you mentioned this in the very beginning, Keith, in your first lecture. Did I say 2%? So people say between 2 and 5. There are different numbers. But yeah, the brain represents a small amount of matter in our body, but for some mystical reason, it's consuming up to 20% of all our energy. Mm-hmm. And Kim, which other images did you want to refer to here for that? Okay, so that's the that? image on the right, which is the pet image. And the fact that it's really, really dark means there's a lot of metabolism there. So that means that it's um, the, the energy is being taken up there. Mm -hmm. You look at the rest of the body and there's, you know, the heart, you can see the heart. Um, so that's uh, right in here. And so that's a bit dark as well. Um, just uh, showing you that there's a lot of energy being taken up by the heart or being used by the heart. What's up with the what's up with the spot on the bottom? <laughs> what's oh. <that? laughs> Keith, what's your you should know this. You're saying what is this right here? This yeah, is the bladder. So the oh, FDG okay. is what happens is um you inject it intravenously and then it goes throughout the body and then when it's used it's kind of stored and and then in the, and so it's stored in the brain cells and then it radioactive decays but not all of it gets stored before it gets excreted and so you can see a little bit there in the bladder being stored so, interesting yeah so um okay so obviously keith you don't know much about anatomy outside of the brain <laughs> <laughs> It looks a little lower than the bladder to my eyes, but yeah, I've never been good at anatomy. All right, so let's keep going here. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about is that, um, and and we talk about this a little bit um, in this in this lecture, is that the brain doesn't have any any reserves, so all of the energy must come in by the cerebral blood flow. It comes in through the through the blood. And in this uh, figure right here, this table, um, what we're doing is we're, we're telling you some of the physiological variables that are used for describing the brain. Um, so there's a, you know, let's just go through some of them, the cerebral blood flow, for example. So that's the, the as the, how much blood is coming up into the brain um, as a, a flow rate. It's a little different than the cerebral blood volume, which is sort of at any one point in time, what's the volume of blood that's in the brain? So they're related to each other, but a little different. Um, when we get to the functional ultrasound, he's going to tell you that what you're seeing with the functional ultrasound is the cerebral blood volume. So how much of the uh, um, signal that you get is, is in the blood. Um, so some of the other things that we see here, cerebral metabolic rate of glucose. So that's how fast the, the brain is using up the glucose, the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen. So you need oxygen in order to metabolize glucose. So those are going to most likely go together. The oxygen extraction fraction. So that's how much of the uh, oxygen in the blood gets extracted out. And then there's the arterial oxygen content. So the equation at the bottom is really interesting. So what we have here is the 
um, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen. So how much oxygen is being used by the brain is equal to the amount of oxygen that's coming up into the brain. So that's the O2 concentration in the arterial blood. How much of that gets extracted? There are uh, oxygen extraction fraction, and then multiplied times the uh, cerebral blood flow. So um, maybe I, I should have done this in a different way. How much comes up by the blood blood flow, how much of that blood is the oxygen, and then how much of that gets extracted. And that has to equal the metabolic rate of oxygen. So which one, which ones can we uh, go through and look at which ones can we pick up with MRI or ultrasound or PET? Should we go through those? Um, yeah, so the PET is going to tell us about the cerebral metabolic rate of glucose right there. Um, and so that's what we were seeing is with the, the FDG PET. Um, with the functional ultrasound, we're going to see cerebral blood volume. We'll have a little discussion about that in the lecture. With MRI, it's a little complicated. And really what we're doing with MRI and we'll talk about this a little bit in preface to Leonard's lecture, is mostly in with the fMRI, we're sensitive to the oxygen extraction fraction. And um, because what we'll be looking at is the, the, um, the amount of oxygenated blood um, before and after, there's a during and after before a task. And so it's, it's, we're looking at the oxygenation rate. So that's really telling us about the oxygen extraction fraction. So a little bit different. And you know, one of the things actually that we touch on in the lecture as well is like, what is the difference between functional ultrasound and functional MRI? And um, so we'll have a little bit of a discussion about that. And, and maybe even later on, we can get Leonard to weigh in on that question as well. Yeah. And just to mention, because a lot of people wonder, and myself included, very interested, why would blood volume or flow increase with neural activity? How does that happen? Why does it happen? The sort of why is obvious because that brain region needs more energy. It needs more glucose to reestablish resting membrane potential, which you've already learned about, and to continue spiking at a heightened rate. And sort of the how that Kim and I have talked about in the past um, generally breaks down to um, non-neuronal cells like astrocytes and glia detecting when the neurons in the neighboring area are active and then secreting signaling molecules to relax these smooth muscles that surround the arteries. So when they're relaxed, the basically the arterial walls open up and that allows for more flow and volume. And we're not super experts in the field, but we'd be happy to talk about that more in detail later. Okay, so um, why don't we get started with the lecture? Let's hop in. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is turn to um, introduction of Tommaso. Keith, can you introduce our speaker, please? <laughs> yes, I am thrilled to bring Tommaso Diani to join us today. He was actually the original sort of person that got me interested in ultrasound, and I know has, has worked with Kim in the past as well. Tommaso has just a deep expertise in all things ultrasound. He's done imaging technologies for cell phones all the way to nanoparticle release. And more recently at Stanford, he's been working on methods for basically imaging activity in the whole brain using ultrasound while you're performing some manipulation. So you can see that there's sort of deep connection to lectures that we've given you and lectures that we're gonna get into later on. Kim, what, what other things are connected to Tommaso's work here? Well, so later in the class, we're gonna talk about drug delivery using focus ultrasound. So he's gonna talk a little bit about that part, but um, just for the students to remember that, that there's gonna be more on that coming up later. Tommaso, did I say your last name right? I've known you for years and I still mess it up. Yeah, that's that's okay, and that's pretty normal. I understand it's difficult. Uh, it's the Yanni, yeah. The Italian. There, are, there are too many like symbols in there, like too many double, you know, like double letters. So I understand it's hard. Yeah. It's okay, good. Well, why don't you go ahead with your lecture? <laughs> All right. Yeah. So thank you, Kim and Keith, for having me. It's great and it's 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 a lot of fun. So it's a great pleasure to be here and talk about a little bit about functional ultrasound. So 
this is a brief outline of what I'm going to go through. I will first introduce uh, Doppler ultrasound imaging. Then we will dig a little bit deeper into uh, the specific problems that we try to um, solve for functional ultrasound imaging. Then I will um, tell you a little bit about some of our latest technical development in developments in functional ultrasound. And finally, um, about using pharmacofunctional ultrasound to decode spatiotemporal dynamics of uh, ketamine action. So let's start with Doppler ultrasound. So many of you may be familiar already with the Doppler effect. So it's uh, it's very common to to uh, experience that um, shift in in pitch when, for example, an ambulance is approaching and then leaving, um, and and so the the pitch is increasing and then kind of going down as the ambulance is um, is leaving us, and this is because the um, when the um, source of the sound is moving, um, the wavefront is experiencing a compression of the wavefront on one side and the dilation on the other side. So now let's assume that we are emitting a sinusoidal wave up here. It's a sinusoidal pulse um, with a frequency of F0. And now we have a receiver placed in A, so on the positive side of the velocity here. And so this receiver is perceiving the sound um, as a higher pitch sound. And so the wavefront is uh, is basically shifted in frequency, and the Doppler shift that we that I report here is equal to the frequency of the original emitted sound, but there is a multiplication factor that is dependent on the speed of sound c, divided by c minus the velocity of um, the source. So it's the velocity of the car in this case. Now let's assume that we have a, a receiver in B. So B will experience a dilation of the wavefront. So it will, um, it will hear a lower pitch sound. So the relation holds true, it's still the same relation, but now just the sign of the velocity is, um, is inverted. So as a consequence of that, the received frequency will be, uh, will be lower. And just as a reminder, so Bs here is the source velocity and C is the speed of sound that is equal to one over the, the square root of one over the mean density multiplied by the compressibility of the medium. Okay, so now let's go back to our, let's go to our ultrasound imaging system. And let's assume that we have a, a focused ultrasound transducer like the one you have seen in the um, lectures, um, the, the demos from last week. So we have a focused ultrasound transducer that we use in this case, both in transmit and in receive. So this transducer, is emitting an ultrasound wave that has the form of a sinusoid, just like before, with a frequency F0. And the sinusoid is modulated by a um, multiplication factor GT. That is just an amplitude multiplication um, factor. So this transducer is transmitting a pulse. This pulse is propagating, but now we have a scatterer in front of the transducer. So this scatterer is scattering back an ultrasound wave that it is depicted here in blue, that is then traveling to the transducer and the transducer is recording that wave. So the transducer is pulsing, like transmitting and then listening and then transmitting and then listening. And so, um, and these are some typical parameters uh, that I'm reporting here because I understand it can be confusing. I mean, uh, if you are looking at um, ultrasound, focused ultrasound neuromodulation, for example, uh, um, the parameters that we use here in, in, in Doppler ultrasound imaging are, are completely different than, than those. So just to give you an idea, the center frequency is usually um, above two megahertz, and it can span between from two megahertz to 40 megahertz, depending on the application. So it can go to very high frequencies. The pass repetition frequency is usually as high as possible, and it's usually in the order of kilohertz. And then the pulse duration is, in, is very short. So usually we use between one and more or less one and eight cycles of a sinusoid. And this is because we want to keep the resolution as high as possible. So we only want a, like very short pulses. What's the deal with the amplitude modulations? The students just uh, sort of learned about that. I'm curious how it plays a role here. Um, so in this case, the amplitude modulation is just to chop the sinusoid in our exercise because the sinusoid here goes 
anywhere from t minus infinity to t infinity, right? If mm -hmm. you don't specify that actually the sinusoid is, is limited in time. Um, and so we use this amplitude modulation factor, which can be uh, in our simple example here where we have just you know the pulse without modulation, it's a rect function, right? So we're just literally chopping the, the sinusoid. Uh, but it can be can be a ramp function. Uh, it can be a hemming window, hanging window, tucking window, whatever we, we like for for our application. Yeah. Very cool. So going back to our exercise here, going back to our transducer. Now let's assume that this transducer is emitting a pulse. Okay, we call it transmit one. So this transducer is transmitting a pulse. The pulse travels. It's the scatter, the scatter scatters um, uh, way front back towards the transducer. This is received by the transducer and is this pulse that we receive here. And it goes here into our system, okay? So now we have a nice pulse that we have, um, that we have recorded and put there on the side. And then we repeat this, this thing. We do this again. So now we have another, a second pulse that is transmitted by the transducer. It travels. It reaches the scatterer, but now the scatterer has moved. So before the scatterer was here, now the scatterer has moved a little bit. And V here is the velocity of this scatterer. So now we have this pulse that is traveling back to the transducer, is recorded by the transducer, and goes in here. And if you pay attention down here, if you look closely, you will notice that the two pulses are now shifted in time. And this is because the time of flight from the transducer to the scatterer and then back has increased. And it has increased by this time shift here, Ts, that is equal to 2v, where v is the velocity of the scatterer, divided by the speed of sound and multiplied by the pulse repetition period that we call here TPRF, that is equal to 1 over the pulse repetition frequency. So this was the second pulse. Now we do it again. Now we transmit a third pulse. Again, this is transmitted by the transducer. It's propagating to the, to the scatterer. The scatterer now has moved a little bit further, again, um, with the same velocity v. This pulse travels back to the transducer, is recorded, and goes in here. And if you notice here again, it is shifted a little bit more. So after we repeat this operation a number of times, you can notice here that the pulse is shifted more and more and more in time. So this is at the basis of what we use for every uh, or for nearly all uh, pulse Doppler ultrasound imaging systems. Now this is a more of a kind of a, a thought exercise because what do we do in practice? Um, in practice, we are only interested in one single sample, right? Because we want to estimate the velocity conveniently in our case of a focus transducer at surprise at the focus because that's where we have the highest resolution right so it doesn't make sense to store all these signals if we're only um, interested in one so that's what we do in reality we save one single sample at the depth that we want for each of these signals and if you look at the received signal it will look something like this so if you notice down here we are sampling here so the pulse is far away we don't have almost anything then the pulse starts to approach our, our uh, sample location and you start seeing the pulse and then it goes away. Um, and so we don't have anything again up here. So we can modulate this signal that we received that we call Doppler signal as we report here. Now, the, I, this is a, uh, is not an exact uh, relationship because there are some multiplication factors that I'm omitting here for the sake of simplicity. Um, but the pulse, we will look like we look like some sort of a sinusoid again. Again, we see the frequency of the emitted pulse here. It is dependent on the pulse repetition frequency because it's the interval between uh, that is sampled at here. But now we have a multiplication factor in front of the frequency, and this is dependent on the velocity. So the the, the frequency of the emitted pulse that is f zero is now multiplied by 2b over c. And so now you start to understand that if we have some knowledge on the frequency of the pulse that we receive, we can actually retrieve the velocity of the scatterer. 
And this is what actually what we actually do in practice. So the power spectrum of the Doppler signal that we receive is a replica of the spectrum of the emitted signal with a scaled frequency axis. So on, on the top plot here, this is a, uh, an example of a power spectrum um, of an emitted pulse with a frequency, with a peak frequency of F0. And the, receive, the Doppler signal that we receive will look exactly the same in principle, but now the axis is shifted. So the, the, the pulse here is not centered at F0 anymore, but it's, it's centered at F0 multiplied by two, the velocity, two times the velocity divided by the speed of sound. So now we know FP because we can find it from the signal that we receive. We know F0 because it's, it's the, the frequency of the pulse that we transmit. We know the speed of sound in the medium. And so we can retrieve the velocity of the scatter by inverting this relationship. And this is exactly what we do in nearly all pulse Doppler ultrasound imaging systems. Now, this was obviously a very simplified case um, with a single scatter, which is not, not very useful in practice. Uh, but um, the way we kind of can address the, the so the blood will, also, uh, will obviously look much more complicated. It's a, um, we can consider it as a random distribution of scatterers. And um, the main contributor to blood scattering is red blood cells. There are some, there are disc shaped cells with a thickness of approximately two micrometers and a diameter of seven micrometers. And these will be randomly distributed in, in the blood vessel as we can see down here schematically. But also these will move, each of these uh, cells will move in, this, in the vessel with, at a different velocity because the velocity will not be the same in, in, the, in the vessel. And in a simplified case like this one, where we have a stationary parabolic flow profile. So you can, you can imagine that each of these cells in here is moving with a velocity dependent on the distance from the center. So it's like, as you see the parabolic velocity profile that changes here. But in reality, it is even more comp this is still a simplification because it's even more complicated than that. We almost rarely have um, a parabolic profile in, in, in blood vessels, only in very stationary conditions. Otherwise, it's very turbulent. But um, surprisingly enough, the same relations that we just derived in our simplified case with one single scatterer still um, hold true. The difference is that instead of being V in our case was just one number, right? Because we have one single scatter moving at the velocity, V becomes a distribution of velocities. So it's the distribution of velocities within, um, within the, um, the blood vessel. But the same relations that we just derived are still true and we'll still, uh, we can still use them to, uh, to find the velocity uh, of the blood within our vessels. Okay, now we have a basis to understand how Doppler imaging works, and we can move on to uh, dig a little deeper into the functional ultrasound part. To understand why functional ultrasound um, kind of emerged only recently, relatively recently indeed, the, the first paper was published in 2011, so it's a relatively recent development. Um, while we have, you know, we have been able to do blood flow imaging with ultrasound for over 50 years now. So um, to understand why only now we are able to, to do what we're doing with functional ultrasound, we need to look at the tissue clutter removal problem. So now we are doing the, the same thing as before, right? We are sampling one sample per each signal that we transmit as we just did in the previous exercise. But now the scatterer is stationary. So the scatterer is not moving anymore. Every time we transmit, the scatterer is still in the same position. So the Doppler signal that we receive here will look, not surprisingly, like a, we'll have a constant value, like we'll look like a, a, a DC um, signal. We just have a constant value because the, the pulse that we receive will always be positioned in the same location. So we will always sample the, that pulse at the same point. Tommaso, you're, so you're saying the blood is also being replaced by more blood scatterers of the same sort of random distribution. So it'll always look the same when, when it's coming back. 
Is that right? Well, in this case, yes. But I mean, I'm not, uh, maybe I should go back. We're not looking at, uh, we're still looking at a simplified case with one single scatterer again to make things simple. So we're still okay. looking at a situation like this with one single scatterer, okay. But now that scatterer is not moving anymore. So all these pulses are aligned here, right? They will not, they, there's no time shift. Gotcha. So if we sample a signal like that, it will look like a constant value because we are always sampling at the same time. So it will look like something like this. Now, if we take, for the ones of you who are familiar with uh, signal processing, so this is, we can look at this as a rect function, right? It's, it's basically zero, 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 goes up to a, a certain value and then it's zero again. If we take a Fourier transform of that function, it will look like a sink. And this is what we see here. So this is the spectrum of a stationary scatterer of the, the spectrum of the Doppler signal received from a stationary scatterer. And this is what we look here. Okay. So now the first problem is that the blood signal is approximately 40 dB or 100 times weaker than the signal from the surrounding tissue. So now we need to, to filter out this huge tissue component here to only retain a very tiny little signal that is coming from the blood. So this is already a big, big problem. And this is like a problem for the, that we have to solve for all uh, blood, um, blood flow imaging applications using ultrasound. Tommaso, yes. in the prior discussion, you didn't mention the Fourier transform. So here. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, yeah, you, so you're- Oh, well, I just said the spectrum, yes. Mm -hmm. So we take this signal here, uh -huh. okay, and this is the spectrum. So the relationship that is yeah, between that signal and this power spectrum here, here is a Fourier transform. Okay, yes. so thank you, thank you take you this signal that. and then you, you have this one, but now you're saying that if you now add in stationary signal, that there's a big component at the DC part of That's this only graph. stationary in this case. This is only stationary signal. Yeah. Okay, and now schematically, just mm -hmm. as an exercise, I'm just showing that the blood signal is much, much that will be displaced here. So it will look like something like the other spectrum that we looked mm -hmm. at before. Mm -hmm. So will be much, much weaker than the component from the tissue. So it will be some tiny little signal riding over this huge signal from the, from the tissue. Wait, Does that make sense? No, so I'm missing something also because when you analyze the signal, you're you're basing it on the the time that it comes back as to what part you're looking at. So, um, based on the the time that the echo comes back, you're in the middle of the vessel. You're looking at the signal from the middle of the vessel. Mm -hmm. So, why is there a big uh, component that that uh, at the zero frequency? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, I mean, if we're looking exact, if like in an ideal situation where we have no uh, kind of leakage, so to speak, in our signals or like, you know, our beam looks exactly like we want it to look. So it's very tightly focused. We have a very good point spread function at the, um, at the focus and we're looking at the middle of the vessel. Then yes, you're right. There is, there will only be signal from the blood, but as we move away from the center of the vessel, I mean, usually we want to look at the entire vessel. And so we all, we will, as we approach the vessel walls, this problem will be more and more uh, prominent. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there is another issue that is our point spread find, there is always leakage from the tissue. You have this very strong uh, signal that is always leaking within the vessel as well. Because the point spread function will never be like perfect. There will be, uh, you know, we look at point spread functions at a level of minus six dB, right? When we look at the full width of maximum, okay. But now you have a weak, like you have um, um, like a very strong scatterer out of your point spread function, but because it's 40 dB over the scatterer that you're looking at within the vessel, mm -hmm. even if that point spread function goes way down at that point, you will still have a very strong signal that is messing around with the signal that you receive from the blood. Does it make sense? 
what I'm saying? It's like you see the point spread function. Yeah. No. Right. So but, maybe another way to think about it is the signal that's coming from maybe just outside the vessel and those side lobes that are kind of, or maybe your beam has side lobes that are including the signal that's coming from outside the vessel. That's correct. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Got you have it. basically you have a you have a, it's an all all things are combined in in practice. You have. Yeah components from within the vessel, outside right. of the vessel, right. because you have these very strong scatterers that are leaking in your signal. Right. Uh, and so in, in reality, you have a yeah. lot of these things combined. So, but what you want in the end is just a bot signal, right? So whatever, everything else needs to be filtered out. Mm -hmm. But when the, the, the other components, the, the spurious components that you want to filter out are so strong compared to the blood signal that you want to retain is obviously it, it, it's it's very hard to do that filtration process. This is in general in all in all applications. To make things worse, blood is slower in smaller vessels, and capillaries make up 50, eighty-five percent of the brain vasculature. So we're looking at very tiny little vessels in the brain, and if you remember, the frequency of the Doppler spectrum is proportional to the velocity, right? So as the velocity goes down, the frequency goes down as well. So it means that our spectrum now will be a little bit closer to the zero frequency here, but that means that it will be even more overlapped with this huge lobe that we see at the center here. I should also add that, I, I mean, I didn't put it in the slide, but also this is, the, the tissue is hardly ever completely stationary. So it's moving itself as well. So there is also that component that will make this um, spectrum here get even wider. So you have a wider spectrum here, a huge main lobe and a tiny blood spectrum that is shifting towards the zero frequency because the velocity gets very, very slow in, in small blood vessels and it's very tiny and we need to kind of retain that component. So it's a very, it's a very challenging um, filtering, uh, filtering process. Yeah, it sounds pretty challenging because you're trying to get the capillary flow separated from just brain pulsation and the velocities are really small. Um, That's correct. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But again, for the ones of you who are familiar with uh, signal processing, if you have a rec, a rec function, you take a Fourier transform, you have a sink. This is what we see here, okay? Now, a dilation in time corresponds to a compression in frequency. What that means, if you take the time window here and you expand it, if you take a rect function and you expand it in time, you take the Fourier transform of that, you, have still, you still have a sink function, but the lobes will be narrower. Conversely, if you compress in time, so if you have a narrower window in time and you take a Fourier transform, the lobes will be broader. Now, because we want to retain only this tiny little signal here, we want to separate these two as much as possible. So it's helpful to have very long observation times so that we can make this sink here as narrow as possible and so that we can more efficiently filter the clutter the tissue clutter from the blood signal that, that we want to actually retain so long observation times are the key here and that's why only recently with gpu beamformers and with uh, fast ultrasound scanners that are able to um to use to emit um, plane waves and, and to beamform plane waves. Um, that's, that's the reason why only recently with those kind of more hardware technological innovations, um, th those innovations have enabled us to, uh, to do plane wave imaging. And that's why now we can look at those very tiny vessels in the brain with a very good resolution. And this is, I, I'm just about to explain how. <laughs> 
Okay, you made a jump there when you said that the um, development of being able to use plane waves gives you long observation times because- I, I'm, I'm coming to that. Okay, yes. good. Yes, right. yes, yes. So now let's now we have this system, we're doing plane wave imaging here, okay? So in a conventional system, what do you do? You transmit a, a focused beam, okay? And you receive, and what you receive basically gives you a line in your image or a couple lines, okay? Vertical lines in this case, if you have the transducer on top here. And so you're kind of transmitting fast, um, focused beams and kind of creating the image, let's say from left to right, and then you go back and you start over and you create another image. But you do it in a sequential way, wave. In plane wave imaging, we transmit plane waves. So every time we transmit a pulse, we are using the whole aperture, the whole transducer here, the whole array of transducers, I should rather say. And every time we transmit the pulse, we reconstruct a full image. So we're not, not reconstructing one line anymore. We do the full image because we have a, we have a broad beam. We just insonify everything and then we listen. And then we beam form that data that we get and we create one image. Now we can retain the receive focusing, right? Because that's something that we do in post-processing in, in, mm -hmm. in hardware or software, but still we collect all the data and then we beam form it. Um, so we can re retain the receive part of re receive focusing, but we lose the transmit focusing because before you remember we had a, a, a focused beam. Now we have a non-focused beam that is a plane wave that is just traveling through the field of view. So as a result of that, the image that we beam form is it will be a lower resolution image, lower resolution than the end contrast than the image that we would get from a focus from focus emissions. Okay, but now we can combine several of these images coherently from different angles, and by doing that, so basically we are looking at the same point. So let's imagine we, we look at one point, we get a, a very broad point spread function, point, yeah, point spread function in our image, okay? So that will be very, our point will look smeared out. But then we look at that same point from another angle and we get that same kind of smeared out image, but a little bit rotated. And then we look at a series of angles. So we will have all these smeared images of our point that we all be rotated a little bit. So when we add them all together, the center of that point will come up while the rest will be still kind of low, at a low amplitude. We did it um, yesterday when we had uh, the Doppler um, scanning up and we, instead of having a rectangular field of view that was straight down from the transducer, we angled it to the side. So they got to see that we angled it one way to the end, uh, also the other way, so that there was a component, you know, towards the transducer and then the color would change. Nice. Yeah. So they had a, an idea that you can angle the beam. Um, exactly. Yes. But the difference here is that most likely in that application, you're still using focused beams, even, yeah. in, even though they are steered, they're yeah. still focused. So you're still yeah. sequentially looking at like building yeah. up your image. Yeah. While here, you are building the whole image every yeah. time you yeah. transmit the pulse. Yeah. So that's the difference. Yeah, anyway. we didn't talk about the receive side um, yet. And so, okay. um, yeah, so the basic idea is just on the receive side that you can get the data that comes back and have a combination with uh, phasing it appropriately so you can kind of be sensitive to just a beam. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yes. And then so you can be sensitive to a beam at different angles just by how you combine the data that comes back. Exactly, yes, yeah. exactly. So it's a smart way to, to build the image that is not sequentially anymore, but it's parallel. So we, we look at the whole field of view, we receive everything and then we build the image mm -hmm. later on. Um, and the receive part will kind of be similar in the sense that we're still beam forming, you know, in the points mm -hmm. where we are, where we have some signal, right? But because we are losing the transmit focus that we would have a physical transmit focus when we transmit a focus beam, like the beam, the ultrasound will be physically focusing in one point and then diverging, right? Here, we don't have that in transmit anymore. So we kind of recreate it virtually in a way, if you will, by combining different angles. 
Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. So by doing that, like if you remember, I, I mentioned like every time we transmit in a conventional system, we build one line or just a couple of lines in our image, right? So to build the whole image, we will have to transmit 96, 128, 164 lines, something in, in that order. But now, because of our trick, we need just a few emissions, in this case, 16, in this, in this, um, in this simplified uh, schematic here. We transmit eight, um, 16 times, and we can already have a good picture of our, um, of our field of view. So because of this, we can now have very fast scanning sequences and we can have very long observation windows, which was not possible before because simply we didn't have the hardware to process that much data, for example, um, or, or to, to even sample that much data. It used to be that the beamformers were, were um, um, hardware beamformers, mm-hmm. so you didn't have to save all that data before. You could just kind of get the samples that you needed and, and beamform in hardware and just get the picture out. But that wouldn't work in this case. So we needed software beamformers. And so now we can save all the data and then do all the, the things that we want in post-processing. So that's why yeah. only recently the, this um, became kind of a reality. So it seems yes. like you're doing the same thing that we could do before for one line, but now you're getting the whole volume. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you could okay. get before, yeah. but then you get one line, which is not, That's not right. very interesting. Uh, but now we can get the whole, at least the whole plane, if it's if we have like, a, a, if we're looking at a, a 2D imaging system or the whole volume, if we have a 3D imaging system. Exactly. So now going back to our Doppler, we can have very long sequences. And typically we have between 200 or, or people have used between 200 and 500 um, images per single, to create a single power Doppler image. So imagine if you had to do that with single lines and every time you want to build a line, you need to transmit 200 times, 400 times. I mean, by the time you, you are done with building your image, a few seconds passed and, and, and when you're going back, it's kind of, you have such a poor temporal resolution and besides things have moved. So you can simply not um, rely anymore on the data that you're, that you're looking at. But because, because of this trick here, we can have very long sequences. And so now in each of these pixels, we will have a Doppler signal like the one we had before when we looked at one single sample in, in the signals that we, we receive. And if we look at the spectrum of that Doppler signal, again, through a Fourier transform, it looks something like this. I mean, we have the, the blue part here is the blue plot is the Doppler signal. There will be uh, a component of tissue centered around the, the zero frequency. And then there will be some blood signal around it. And then we, we, now we, can do a much more efficient because this uh, clutter, tissue clutter component is much narrower. It's much easier to filter it out. So our clutter filter now is, is much more efficient. So we filter the tissue out, we retain the blood signal in red here. And then to get to the power Doppler image, because it's power, we take an integral of the square of the um, spectrum here, of the blood spectrum. So we do that for each of the pixels that we have in our images, and we get a power Doppler image of the whole brain. So this is what I'm showing here. This is a power Doppler image showing the brain vasculature. Mm-hmm. It's one screenshot of yeah. the brain vasculature in the right brain. Yeah. So let's just to clarify with power Doppler, you're not quantitating the velocity but it's more like you're saying how much signal is at a velocity that's non-zero and we'll just add it all up and give it a color, you know, give it a color on the picture. Exactly. I mean, it's so uh, power Doppler is like more, more specifically power Doppler is proportional to cerebral blood volume. So we're not looking, so 
when we do velocity estimation, you would take maybe something like the mean of this spectrum here, right? The mean frequency. And that will give you the velocity in that point. Okay. But with power Doppler, we are not really interested in velocity, rather in cerebral dot volume. So when we take the integral here, this will be, we are integrating the whole resolution cell. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we're looking at the plot volume in that resolution cell. With the assumption that all the blood is moving. Because yes. if there's blood that's not I mean, moving. You, you have a distribution of velocities, of course. Yes. I mean, if the blood is stationary, which is not usually not the case, but if the blood is stationary, yes, it will be filtered out. Okay. Good. In this part here, together with the tissue. But everything else stays. And it, it's integrated and it goes into our power doctor image. So this is what we get here. Also, really quick, get everyone excited. Why, uh, why is it important to know blood volume in any given region of the brain? Just give me a, a second, because nice. that's actually the next one. I knew so it was thank coming. you, Keith, for, for, yeah, for asking that. So once we build the power, we do all those plane waves and we build the compound frames, we acquire a bunch of those, 200 to 400, and we build one single power doppler image we have nothing more than a screenshot of the brain vasculature at that time. And that's not very interesting because it's just a screenshot, right? So the way we can get functional information is through neurovascular coupling. So the, the trick here is that the brain has no intrinsic energy storage capacity. So there is no, almost no way for the brain to storage energy. So every time there is some local neural activation, there must be a regional blood flow increase to supply oxygen and nutrients to the neural cells that are working more and getting activated. And this is what we define as neurovascular coupling. And so now you understand that we can use blood flow measures that we can detect in our case via power Doppler imaging. We can use those measures as a proxy for neural activity. And this is at the basis of um, also like blood oxygen level dependent or bold fMRI, of course, functional ultrasound, functional near infrared spectroscopy. So all the, the neuroimaging modalities that are relying on, on the neurovascular coupling and that are using blood, some sort of blood flow uh, measures to kind of track neural activity. Have you ever benchmarked against any of those? Like, would you tell someone, hey, I'm going to someday replace fMRI? Because that's a really expensive. Bulky we'll get back process. to that. Yes, we'll get back. Yeah, I, I, I will go through that in a in a in a bit. Yes, but thank you for asking. Yes, no problem. Okay, so when there's brain activity, then there's going to be a change in cerebral blood volume as well as cerebral blood flow, and you're going exactly. to see it on your power Doppler. Yes, in our case, what we see with power Doppler is an increase in cerebral blood, blood volume. Okay. You can look at cerebral blood, blood flow as well. You can look at cerebral blood flow with ultrasound, cerebral blood flow with, F with MRI. Uh, you can look at bulb signal with, that is looking at um, blood oxygenation with, fMRI, with MRI as well. So these are all different ways, but that we use blood flow or the blood stream or the stream of oxygen in the, in the, in the vasculature to track to go back and track neural activity so it's an indirect way if you will to uh to look at neural activity but it's a way that 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 works because the brain has no way to storage energy there so when the cells are getting activated they need oxygen and they recruit blood to to bring that oxygen to the cells so we can either look at blood oxygenation or or blood flow or blood volume and and these measures will sometimes correlate, sometimes a little less, but they will all kind of uh, indicate um, like neural activation in the brain. Okay. So this is just to kind of dig a little deeper into what, what happens in a, in a practical case. We are stimulating a rod visual cortex with LEDs binocular LEDs. So we're stimulating both the, the, the eyes. Uh, 
This is a sequence of power Doppler images that we collect. Now, if you look at one pixel, let's imagine that we're looking at one pixel in, in these images, and we're looking at it like through our sequence, okay? This pixel happens to be conveniently located in, in the right visual cortex. And so when we look at the cerebral bot volume variation, you can see that there is no stimulus, the CBV signal, sorry, cerebral bot volume or CBV, I should specify, the CBV signal for short is low, then there is a stimulus coming. So the CBV signal goes up to supply blood to the, um, to the cells, then the stimulus goes down and the blood, the CBV signal goes down and so on. So you can see that the CBV signal tracks the, um, the stimulus or tracks the neural activity in the visual cortex. So what we do to, here to build these correlation maps, we just take a correlation between the CBV signal and the stimulus. And this is what we show here on the heat map. Heat map. So the, the grayscale image is again, the, a power Doppler that I'm showing just for reference. And the heat map is actually showing the parts of the, the pixels that are statistically significantly correlated with the stimulus. So stimulus goes up, CBV signal goes up, stimulus go down, goes down, CBV signal goes down. So this is where we have statistically significant correlations between these two signals. And that tells us that the activity in that part of the brain is actually following the stimulus that we are delivering through the eyes. So this is kind of a good way to check that what we are that we are driving neural activity indeed with um, with with the with the LEDs and what we are reading is the neural activity in the regions that we would expect to get activated. Very very cool image. Yeah, could you um, briefly just sort of orient us to the picture because um, okay. part of the problem is that um, there's not very much, you know, you kind of zoomed in and I can see the very black line at the top, meaning that's outside the animal. So you mean anyway, here? Just, yeah, and then what are the bright lines and yeah. Okay, you mean starting from this one? Yeah. Okay, so this one is a power Doppler image, is the analogous of this image that I show here, okay. So it's just a power Doppler image. It's a screenshot of the CBV status in our of our brain slice. That's like a screenshot. It's like yeah, how you know, the I CBV understand looks. that. I guess okay. what I'm asking is, there's cortex up at the top. This is the cortex up yes. here. Yeah. Then we have um, like white matter here in between, so it's less vascularized. Okay. Then the cortex kind of wraps around in this part of the brain. And this is uh, sub. This is the thalamus. So actually, up here we have the superior colliculus, which, by the way, is also showing some activation down here. So the superior colliculus is basically relaying visual information uh, from the, the, is a part of the thalamus that is relaying visual information to the visual cortex, and it's also getting activated down here. Um, and then the 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 other parts are um, kind of other subcortical regions that I cannot remember. And maybe Keith, you are more familiar with that as you are more uh, of, a, of a neuroscientist than that. Just see cortex and then stuff underneath the cortex. So this is all cortex here. Actually, the cortex here wraps yeah. around. So this is all cortex mm -hmm. here. And this is subcortical down here. You got we, are, we, we are at Bregma minus uh, seven. I, I'm sufficiently satisfied. We can okay. move on now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we already mentioned that the magnitude of the uh, power Doppler signal is proportional to cerebral blood volume. Again, I would like to give you just you know some typical parameters that we use. The center frequency is typically pretty high because the blood vessels. By the way, each of these white lines here are blood vessels in this picture. Um, so, and you can see that these are pretty tiny. So these are 100 microns, 200 micron vessels. So the center frequency is usually high uh, because the resolution is proportional to the frequency um, of, our, of our ultrasound signal. So usually we use between seven and at least eight, 18 megahertz. In this case, we use 15 megahertz, just to give you an idea. The pass duration is usually pretty short usually one to two cycles of sinusoid. The 
emitted, the transmitted PRF is usually very high. So the transmitted PRF is the PRF of our plane waves that we, that we uh, transmit. And that's usually pretty high, it's as high as it can be, just limited by the time it takes to the wavefront to reach the bottom of our image and back. So that's what limits our pulse repetition uh, period and, and so our pulse repetition frequency. And then the compound sequence. So the compound frames, if you remember, are the frames that we build up from our plane waves. So we transmit several plane waves and then we build one compound frame. And so we repeat that process with a certain frequency that is usually between 500 hertz and one kilohertz. So before you said you would get 16 images, so it's approximately the emitted PRF divided by 16. Yes, well, if you use 16 images, yes. Yeah. It, it can vary. I mean, that's also something that depends more on the system. Usually you just put a wire there. That's what, that just to give you an idea of what happens in practice, you put like a wire phantom. So you're just looking at a wire that in, in, a, in 2D will look like a point. So you have an estimate of the point spread function, and then you start playing with it and, and use, for example, yeah, 16 plane waves and see how the wire looks. And, or you can use six plane waves and see how the wire looks. And of course, most likely it will look worse, but then it's like, how worse? And you know, is it worth kind of using less plane waves if you, because then you get much less data to process, you get a much faster, so the limitation here usually in, in time is, is not given by the, the pulse sequence because that's usually as fast as it gets. But it's usually, in, the, in my case at least, is in the processing part. So I have a temporal resolution of here 200 milliseconds because I use 200 images at one kilohertz. So the period between compound images is one millisecond. I get 200 of them, my observation window is 200 milliseconds. And that's what I'm using to create one image. But then in reality, I can only do one image, more or less one image per second. And that's just because it's so much data to process that with my super fancy, very advanced machine with the GPU and all, it's still so much data to process that in reality, I can only look at one once per second. I could double the, pro the processing power and, and maybe I will have the, uh, you know, that time and increase the, the temporal resolution. So it's more of a, it's conveniently like a hardware problem. I mean, I can, you know, it's something that can be fixed and can be solved. It's not a physical uh, problem anymore. Like, you know, if we were using pulse um, fog emissions, so it can be overcome, but still kind of to give you an idea of how much data we need to process that's kind of really the bottleneck and I will get back to that. Um, and the resolution in plane is 100 by 100 micrometers. So we have 15 megahertz frequency. The speed of sound is 1500 more or less meters per second. So the, the, um, the wavelength is around 100 micrometers. And that's kind of what defines our resolution. Okay. so. What are the advantages and what are the drawbacks compared to other neuroimaging modalities and specifically fMRI as Keith asked uh, before. So first of all, we have high spatial temporal resolution, higher than fMRI. Um, and so we can look at kind of faster dynamics. Although this is not a, really a problem because I should also mention that neurovascular coupling is usually pretty slow. So it doesn't necessarily help to look um, faster at what happens, but it does help to have um, to have a higher resolution because then we can maybe average more, so we have more data that we can kind of play with. It definitely has a much much lower cost than other imaging modalities, and it is it is portable. So an ultrasound system, as you have seen, is on a cart on wheels. It can be kind of carried around. And so that's very convenient. But also um, it is more sensitive than fMRI. And this is a nice paper uh, that was recently published by Edelman et al. And they compared bold fMRI that we see here on the top row to 
power doctor or functional ultrasound on the bottom row. And they used, they imaged optogenetically driven neural activation. So they were optogenetically stimulating the motor cortex and they were using bald fMRI and functional ultrasound as a readout to, to compare these two modalities. And so here we see, we look at the ipsilateral motor cortex. So this is the site where they are stimulating. And you see that the fMRI does a pretty good job in kind of tracking the stimulation. The, the blue regions here are where, when they're delivering um, optogenetical, op optogenetic stimuli. And you can see that the fMRI does a pretty good job in tracking that with the highest laser intensity. But as the intensity goes down, fMRI with the medium intensity is still kind of tracking it pretty well. With the lowest intensity is almost losing it completely. Power Doppler, conversely, is actually tracking um, neural activity in the motor cortex, in the ipsilateral motor cortex, in all the cases. And now what's even more exciting, so even with 0.1 uh, milliwatt intensity, as you can see here. And what's even more exciting is that in the striatum, fMRI is almost unable to see anything at all. Also, e even with the highest intensities, while functional ultrasound is actually seeing some activation in all the cases. And again, in the contralateral motor cortex, fMRI is seeing something with the highest intensities but it's almost kind of losing any uh, meaningful functional information at the lowest intensities. But again, focused ultrasound, um, functional ultrasound, sorry, uh, is doing a, still doing a pretty good job in tracking neural activation in the ipsilateral motor cortex. So as you understand here, there, there is, for example, some information that we, are, we might be losing with fMRI when we are not seeing any activation, but it, there might be some activation there. And it's just a matter of sensitivity that, that, like, that we have a higher sensitivity with, um, with functional ultrasound, or we have a higher signal to noise ratio, so. Yeah, so signal to noise is a ratio of signal to noise. And so it could be that you have better signal, or it could be that um, the fMRI has more noise. And I wonder, if the the noise that you're seeing on the the upper line, like if you look before the stimulation and it's you know the the curve's going up and down and that's quote noise, is that noise as an electronic noise or noise as in physiological noise? Because yeah. electronic noise you can always do better if you get a better coil or you know do your imaging better, but if it's physiological noise you can't necessarily do any better. Do you know? Well, I, I mean, for one thing, if that was physiological noise, maybe we, it should show up here as well, right? Yeah, I don't know. B but maybe, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, a good, that's a good point. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, and... But whatever their setup was, it definitely... Whatever their setup was, better yeah. ...with your yeah. ultrasound. Although it's really interesting to me to see with the M1 on the ipsilateral side, how the ultrasound seems to come down very quickly. Whereas on yes. the contralateral side, it doesn't. It, it doesn't return to baseline very quickly. Why? That's true. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, what it is. They also, they, they derive you know, um, um, hemodynamic response functions with both fMRI and functional ultrasound and they compare those, but I, I don't, so I, I don't think that answers your question though. So I, I'm not sure why it stays up uh, for for a good while before actually going down. So I'm not sure about that. Yeah, but going back to the hemodynamic, like a, a difference between the two, but it's just in you know the signals that we receive um, is not necessarily indicative of what's better or what not. Is that the hemodynamic response function is actually pretty different. So in the case of fMRI, and this is kind of a known thing, I believe, Keith, um, you know, Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but that fMRI goes up and then you have a kind of a, this rebound period after the pulse here, um, after the, the activation. 
while functional ultrasound kind of stays always kind of above. Yeah. And, and so I think that's the, just a difference. But. The difference here is looking at cerebral blood flow versus volume. But I, I could be wrong, but yeah. I, I'm not, yeah, that's, I'm not sure about, um, about that, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of, um, this paper kind of made the case for, at least in that setup, but the good thing is that they use optogenetically driven stimuli. So they have a very good control over the, at least over the stimulus. Um, so as opposed to pharmacological investigations, which is what we are doing, which is kind of a little bit more like all over the place. So in this case, they, they had a consistent stimulus, um, consistent stimulus patterns. And so they, they compared those two modalities with those, within those kind of, um, with, with those stimuli. Okay, then it's also whole brain modality, like fMRI, uh, but it can be done in a way can freely behaving animals. And this is very is a very interesting thing. I mean, we can do fMRI in awake animals if we restrain them, but it's hard to have the animal running around. And that's something that can be done with, um, with functional ultrasound. So some people have developed very miniaturized um, ultrasound probes that are wearable by the animal. So the animal is free to even perform behaviors uh, while we are imaging the brain. So I, in my opinion, that's, that's very, very exciting because now we can kind of image the animal while it's behaving. So um, I, I'm very excited about that. And it, it, it's been done. So the systems are already kind of available. And then the drawback, of course, is that we have to remove the skull. So that's kind of a little bit of a problem that as you may have learned uh, from the ultrasound neuromodulation, focused ultrasound neuromodulation lectures, the skull is a big problem with ultrasound. It's a little bit on the way, uh, in the way of the ultrasound. And in this case, while we can um, kind of, in focused ultrasound applications, we can use very low frequencies. In this case, we need to use high frequencies because we want to have a, a good resolution because otherwise we won't be able to um, uh, to resolve those very tiny blood vessels. And so we need a high, uh, a high frequency. So the only way we can, uh, we can do that is basically removing, removing the skull. And while this is tedious, but doable in animals, it's definitely a problem uh, with humans. But people have, um, sorry, people have done uh, functional ultrasound imaging in humans and that would show that um, either intrasurgically or through the anterior fontanel window in neonates. So like when there are skull openings in the skull already available, we can still use um, functional ultrasound in, in humans as well. And you're talking about babies, right? Your neonates? Neonates are, yes, babies, babies like newborns, yeah. yes. <laughs> More, more, yeah, it's like the, the fontanel window closes within the first couple of months. Where's that? It's like right here on the baby. It's right, right at the little gap at the parietal. Uh, it's like here in the middle. I don't want to get, yeah, to say names that I'm not too sure about, but it's like here, yeah, in the middle of, of, the, of the head. Okay, so now I will show um, a first, like a demonstration from uh, this was really the first paper that was published by Massé and others in 2011. And it was really the first demonstration that set the field for um, the, the whole functional ultrasound imaging field. Um, so here, what they were doing, they're inducing uh, local epileptic seizures by doing a local injection in the somatosensory cortex. That is here at the site uh, where the green circle is. So they were injecting a pharmacological agent that was inducing um, epileptic seizures. And then let's see what happens. So after they do the injection, you can see the epileptic seizure um, propagating through the cortex. And then you see it, it propagates also through uh, to subcortical regions and at times also to the uh, contralateral cortex. Right is now. this movie sped up or is this real time? Uh, no, it's, uh, you can see the, the timing down here in, in seconds. So it is 
sped up. It's like a hundred X or something. It's really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so epileptic propagation, or at least for activity, readouts is very slow. And it looks like we're seeing a bunch of seizures here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was there multiple injections or one injection led to multiple seizures? I cannot uh, recall that right now. Um, wow. That's so know. interesting. It's just really good signal to noise. And yeah. yeah. Wow. Nice. So yeah, this was the, really the, the first paper that opened the field. Um, and if you go back to the plot here, um, they recorded EEG signals um and the power doctor and so they're just showing that they that they are correlated um these these two um here are the last two in the sequence and you can see that they are they show that the power doctor signal correlates pretty well with the envelope of the um of the eeg signal so this was kind of to, to show that what they are measuring is indeed neural activity um that is actually happening in the brain Um, it's also been done in, in 4D, so 3D plus time. Uh, this is a beautiful paper from um, Rabu uh, and others in, published in 2019. Um, and in this case, thankfully, the video is playing. So we can see functional activation in response to whisker stimulation. And this is what we see here. This is, a, by the way, is a slightly lower frequency i believe it was seven or eight megahertz here because it's a it's a 2d array so it's a it's a you know a whole different story um and so in order to keep things doable the the frequency is much uh, is much lower so it's about half of uh, what we usually use in 2d imaging what kind and of computer could... does this use compared to just the regular plane view is this like a ridiculously power a powerful computer or Maybe this is like. A... I mean, is I don't remember exactly. I mean, they, this group they have their own kind of systems, but um, it's yes. I mean, it's it's just a powerful, it's a powerful computer. But we can do. Typically, we can do the processing also offline. So we can store if we can have like a fast storage. Way you know, a fast way to storage the data to store the data, we don't need to necessarily process it in real time. We can store the data, put it there, and then later on we can just process it offline into a, a cluster of computers or whatever we want to use. And for this experiment, they used a neonate. Just kidding. Well, That's a big these one. are two different experiments here. These are two different papers, one from Rabu and others in 2019 for the functional imaging. The other one, more recent one, was published in 2021 by Baranger and others. And it's functional ultrasound imaging of uh, neonates. Now, the nice thing here is that, first of all, we get these beautiful images. Uh, this is, I'm just showing the power doctor here, um, but we can put links to the paper um, if, if people are interested to look at more kind of functional uh, information. But I, I, I really wanted to show the setup here because they're doing this at the bad side. So these are, uh, these are neonates um that were i think preterm and so it would have been it's hard to put these patients uh into in an fmri scanner and and, and keep them still and so on so uh, this was done at the bad side with a 2d probe so they had a 2d probe uh that they were they were sweeping to to recreate a volume and this is through the um anterior fontanel window as we see here so they were doing sweeping both in one direction and then in the other direction to then build um, a, basically a conical volume uh, from the uh, fontanel window. So this is very interesting applications in humans. It has been done also, in, as I mentioned, intrasurgically. So like for when for tumor resection surgeries, for example, um, it is useful to look at functional information uh, while the, the surgeons are uh, operating, uh, for example. And so functional ultrasound is, it could be a very compact way to do that directly at the bedside. So it's a very interesting, um, these are very interesting applications.
Okay. So now I would like to show some of our uh, latest technical developments with functional ultrasound. These are from our own lab. Um, so by now, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, we understand it pretty clearly that we have a lot of data to process. So these, these sequences are very data intensive, require a lot of computational resources. So we thought, why not um, train a neural network to do the job with much less data? So we trained uh, a neural network that is a, a modified uh, unit that is, has been used in many um, applications in, in biomedical imaging. But now we are feeding um, an undersampled compound sequence. So we just, we acquire the sequence and then we take subset, subsets of uh, compound frames that we feed to the neural network to test if the neural network can actually create power Doppler images using much less data. And we tested data, we obtained data compression factors between 75 and 95%. So with 75% compression factor, it means that we are retaining 25% of the data and discarding 75%. So it's a pretty um, pretty large uh, improvement. With 95%, we are retaining 5% of the data and discarding 95%. So it's also, it's like we have very little data that we are uh, working with. But we were able to reconstruct power Doppler images with uh, good preserving the original image quality and resolution and the sensitivity, as I'm going to show in a, in a bit. So these are the reconstructed power Doppler frames. So in this panel uh, is the state of the art. So this is uh, the same, conveniently the same frame that we looked at before, where we have the, uh, the cortex wrapping around and subcortical regions. Um, so this is reconstructed with the conventional processing with the full sequence of 250 uh, compound frames. And this is using the deep learning reconstruction using less and less data as we go from left to right. And if you look at the absolute error here on the bottom plot, is it, it is more visible that we really have, uh, we start seeing some errors with a 95% compression factor, but it's still doing a pretty good job in the reconstru reconstructing the power Doppler images. While with the conventional processing, so if we just take, keep the same processing, but we feed less data to our processing pipeline, uh, you can see that the errors really start to go up quite significantly uh, as we reduce the, 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 the sequence, the length of the sequence that we use. And this was confirmed by quantitative performance metrics. So we, we looked at um, uh, normalized mean square error, structural similarity index, and peak SNR. And in all the cases, the um, deep learning reconstruction performed significantly better than the conventional. But again, that's just screenshots. So we wanted to look at we want to look at functional information. So we we wondered if the deep learning reconstruction was actually able to to retain kind of that level of of accuracy um, that is needed to reconstruct the, the functional maps. So again, here this is a the same setup as we have um, described before. This is the state of the art activation map, and then on the top row here. Um, we have the um, activation maps reconstructed by the deep learning af after the deep learning. So the, the network doesn't know anything of the functional activation. The network is just reconstructive, reconstructing the power Doppler data. And then we use that data to build the functional maps. So it, start, it starts to degrade with 95% compression factor. But again, we are only retaining here 5% of the data. Um, and the conventional method is, is just losing uh, almost nearly all meaningful functional information already with 75% compression factor. So we kind of demonstrated that the network general, generalized well uh, to these kind of problems, and it can still reconstruct um, CBV signals with about 10% uh, variation. That is what we see here in a typical visually evoked uh, cortical activation um, setup. And also because now we are looking at much shorter uh, observation windows, um, another advantage is that we have much less motion artifacts. So when we do, when we are imaging awake animals, the animals are moving. That's uh, that's 
unavoidable. And so we have to discard quite a, quite a few frames. Um, but of course, if we look at shorter period of, periods of time, the likelihood that the animal will move, will move right there when we are doing the imaging are much, is much lower. And so this is what we see here. Um, so the, the dots here are showing the discarded frames and you can see that it, it, we discard significantly less frames with, um, as we increase the compression factor. Okay, so finally, I would like to um, show a little bit about our latest work with um, pharmacology. So we are using a functional ultrasound to decode spatial temporal dynamics of ketamine action. So in this video here that we are about to see, I'll just pause it. Um, we're looking at a coronal slice of the rat brain again. This time we're a little more anterior. So we are at bragma plus 2.5 millimeters. So we are all the way um, over the frontal cortex. And what we see here in, in, on this slice, we have some prefrontal cortex. We have some uh, other regions in the um, frontal cortex of motor, somatosensory cortex, insular cortex. And also we have some nice, um, some, some cotted putamen and nucleus accumbens. So these are also very relevant and interesting um, places to, to look at. So now we'll see, we'll look at the video. Um, this is with 10 milligrams per kilo of body weight of ketamine. So this is baseline, nothing is happening as we would expect. So the heat map is the CBV signal, by the way. And now we're injecting ketamine. We are giving 10 mg per keg intravenously. And as you see in a few seconds, in a matter of few seconds, you start seeing all sorts of things happening in the brain. But most of it is really focused around the prefrontal cortex here. So we see a very strong um, activation of the, uh, of the prefrontal cortex, some residual activation in the putamen and in the nucleus accumbens, but really most of it is happening, um, is happening around the prefrontal cortex. And then it usually vanishes by uh, 40 to, to 50 minutes. So when we go at 40 minutes, you can see that there is almost nothing left, uh, no, no activation uh, left in the brain. There is some residual, but not specific activation. Wow, this is pretty wild. So this would be obviously very difficult to get at this level of resolution with like an fMRI or a bold imaging. Like this is really new way of approaching what ketamine would do to the brain. Uh, that's that's the cool part. Yes, I mean that we have a, a that we have a very good kind of uh, both spatial temporal resolution and sensitivity. So this brings us to our next slide. So we're looking at now different doses of ketamine. So just to explain a little bit what we're looking at, this is the same slice as before, but now we are we have segmented regions of the brain. And we are looking at the CBV signals over time. So this is at the baseline. We have a 10 minute baseline, almost nothing happening. Here, this is CG1 and 2 up here, okay? So before we inject ketamine, nothing is happening. Just things are oscillating a little bit, but it's not very specific. Then we inject ketamine and very quickly there is activation that kind of then slowly goes down. And this is with 10 milligrams per kilo. That is a dose that is widely used in the animal, uh, in the ketamine literature with, with animals. But then we also looked at five mg per kg. And in this case, we see kind of a, you know, a shift down of the, um, of the curve, which is kind of expected. But then with one mg per kg, so this is a very, it's a much smaller dose. And we still see a pretty high peak but then it goes down quickly. So there's more to it than, than just you know, going up as a function of the, of, the, of the dose, for example. So are the receptors um, um, kind of saturating here, for example, or in which receptors? That's also something that we are looking at right now. Like which receptors are actually involved with this?
So we are now playing with pharmacology to try to understand better uh, what ketamine is actually doing in the brain. But because we have such good sensitivity, we can kind of separate things much more easily than, than we would be able to do with other imaging model, with, with fMRI, for instance, because we have a, we have a higher power. Um, and we, so we see these trends uh, in, in different regions of the brain, at least in this case. Then when we start to play with other receptors, uh, most likely we will see kind of different uh, things happening in, in, in different parts of the brain. But this is with just systemic ketamine. And so this, I don't want, you know, this might be overwhelming, but this is just to wrap up the dose response part. So here we're looking at area under the curve and peak activity uh, that are taken from these plots here. And specifically, particularly the area under, under the curve is showing, you can see the, the dose, like a pretty good kind of dose response with um, no ketamine, one mg per kg, five and, and 10 milligrams per kilo of body weight. So it's kind of, we're starting to decode a little bit uh, what is happening at, at these different doses with a pretty good um, sensitivity. So we're pretty excited about what we'll see next with, with this. It's interesting that a drug is just like lighting up the entire brain, like nothing is suppressed. I don't know what that means, but. Um, it correlates with other um, imaging modalities. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh no, I believe it. I'm just, yeah. I'm just interested. So like if you look at uh, FM, like CBV, fMRI, that's something that people have looked at. Mm -hmm. It correlates pretty well with, with similar doses. And you've uh, also even, done um, propofol. So you have seen the opposite where brain region just shuts off, right? Um, no, I've not done propofol with, with systemic ketamine. Yeah. Oh, sorry, with uh, systemic propofol with functional ultrasound. I've only looked at ketamine because I am very interested in 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 the in the pharmacology of ketamine i think it's just a hot topic right now yeah really and it's been it's used for so many different mm -hmm. for so many different things but um there are also questions on you know which receptors is actually tickling and, and so those are all things that i would really be interested in kind of studying more uh, and trying to get a better understanding of yeah simply how ketamine works and what it's doing Super cool. Okay, so in summary, functional ultrasound is a whole brain neuroimaging modality. We have high spatial temporal resolution, high sensitivity, and conveniently low cost. It may provide unique insights into the spatial temporal dynamics of neuropharmacolic pharmacological agents, like for example, ketamine. Um, and in future developments, it may also uh, be used for, um, it may be established more for um, uh, humans, either intrasurgically or in neonates through the, through the fontanel window. And then I would like to thank our funding bodies and the Air and Lab for making this, um, this work possible. Thanks. All right, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Masa, that was a great lecture. Learned a ton there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a quick question. I'm going to ask just one and you can, you know, you don't have to go too deep, but um, imaging in adults, like obviously would be awesome. If, if we could get it through the skull, like what is the hope there for fu functional ultrasound imaging? Or like I've seen people saying they would do it with Doppler imaging and it seemed like there was a little discrepancy between the two types. Well, this is Doppler, what we are using here is, it power is. Doppler. so yeah so can it be done through like the thinner parts of the skull like the temporal window it, it is actually done clinically uh transcranial uh doppler is actually done is performed in 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 the clinic so it is already there um but the for example the frequency is much lower obviously as you would expect so um the frequency that that frequencies that I use in, in those kind of applications are a few megahertz, like two megahertz, for example. So it's much lower. And so we cannot look, we can only look at major vessels uh, in the brain, but it is done. Now, I personally think that um, contrast agents, for example, may be an option um, in a different kind of application. So it's not actually Doppler, it's what is called 
um, super resolution ultrasound or ultrasound localization microscopy. Um, so it's kind of different applications that are more aimed at uh, looking at the morphology of the vasculature versus the functional information. That is what we're doing here. So it's a little bit different, but in those applications, they have done um, some pretty amazing studies with microbubbles. So when once you inject exogenous contrast agents that are enhancing the ultrasound signal, it might be um, easier to, to kind of compensate for the, the signal that you're losing going through the brain. But also here, maybe, yeah, we should also point out that as opposed to focused ultrasound for, for example, say neuromodulation, in these applications, we have to go through the skull twice because it's pulse echo. So we have to go once when, when we send and then in receive, the signal still has to cross the, the skull again. Um, so that's also something that doesn't make obviously things easier. But yeah, maybe with, with contrast agents, I think that are that there are good chances and people have indeed done something like that with ultrasound, but in different applications, as I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. It's good for the students to see the limitations and to kind of know where they might uh, look to the future. Mm. So when you're referring to using contrast agents, you just mean because the uh, the bubbles are going to reflect so much better than the red blood cells do. Exactly. So you get more signal. Exactly. And so that'll compensate for the losses of the skull. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But then, I mean, you might have different dynamics, right? I mean, you don't know exactly if the micro bubbles are flowing the exact same way as red blood cells, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it might be, but they also stick around. You know, he's like, yeah, I don't know. It's something that yeah, interesting. It, it, it might be that it, it's different, that it that might confound um, what you see. And I believe that's the reason why people have experimented with looking at the morphology of the brain vasculature Mm. rather than the um, kind of the functional information that the, the blood signal is carrying. Okay, so thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs>